Okay, everybody, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, hi, my name is Pete Timmerman. I'm the director of the Webster University Film Series. Uh, we're the sponsors of this event. We're, the, I guess, the only sponsors. We've done quite a few of these virtual film discussions in the past, what, almost year now, but we've always had a partner of some sort. Um, this is the first one that we're doing on our own, but the plan is to keep them going every Thursday night until we can go back to in-person screenings. Um, a little bit about us, if you're not terribly familiar with the Webster Film Series, uh, we're St. Louis's only year-round nonprofit cinema. Um, our usual venue is the Winifred Moore Auditorium on the, um, it's in Webster Hall on Webster University's main campus in Webster Groves. Um, but we haven't been able to show movies in person since last March, obviously. Uh, so we've been doing virtual events instead. Uh, we are still booking movies in our quote unquote virtual theater. Um, as we speak, there is one movie in there now, it's called Just Don't Think I'll Scream, which is a French compilation film, sort of like an experimental documentary. Um, back in 2016, the director of that film suffered a bad breakup and hunkered down in his house and watched movie after movie after movie after movie and made a movie about it, which of course is very pertinent to the way that we live now. Um, and what's funny is I was actually in the process of booking that film when we went into lockdown. Um, so it's, it's, we were so innocent back then. It feels so cute now. Um, but anyway, that film, it's available at um, webster.edu slash film series. Usually pay 10 or $12 to rent those and we get half the proceeds. So it helps us you know, keep the lights on during a fallow period in terms of being able to show movies. Um, and then tomorrow we're opening another one. So Just Don't Think I'll Scream is gonna run one more week, but then one starting tomorrow is a new Kenyan doc documentary called Softy. Uh, Softy was just nominated for Best Documentary at the Producers, Guild's, Producers Guild of America Awards a couple of days ago, just announced about 48 hours ago. Um, a year ago, it was the first Kenyan film to ever play at Sundance, um, but it's a documentary about a photographer turned politician um, whose nickname is Softy, which is where the title of the film comes from. Uh, but we usually open about a film a week. Um, our website's webster.edu slash film series. You can follow us on social media. On uh, Twitter and Instagram, it's at WU Film Series. And on Facebook, it's at Webster Film Series. It seems like Facebook hates us these days, though. Um, so maybe follow us on Twitter and or Instagram instead. We aggravated the Facebook algorithm or something. Um, anyway, so uh, tonight is the first event of what we're calling Fassbender February. The idea behind these uh, Thursday night speaking events is that every calendar month we're going to focus on a different filmmaker and then one different film critic or film academic or just film fan is going to talk about a specific film from that director. And we wanted to start with Ronner Werner Fassbender. Um, we were kicking around ideas about how to handle this program and um, who we could focus on and the group of people that we were having this conversation with all kind of found Fassbender as a common locus of interest. We, all, we were all really big fans of his. Um, so our opening night speaker tonight is Joshua Ray, who I'll introduce a little more thoroughly in just a minute. Uh, but next week we've got Kate Lohr doing uh, The Bitter Tears of Petra von Kant. And then two weeks from now, it's me, I'm the, the featured speaker, which is sort of embarrassing, uh, but that's In a Year with 13 Moons, a film that I adore and is um, a tough sell. Maybe don't go into that one too blind. And then three weeks from not to tonight, sorry, three weeks from tonight is uh, Robert Hunt uh, talking about the third generation. Um, I'm particularly happy to have Robert on board as when I was an undergrad film student, Robert taught a class specifically on Fassbinder to me. I was a student in that class. Um, so we've got three generations of Fassbinder fans doing these Fassbinder presentations. Um, if you haven't seen two, we announced next month's filmmaker is Sofia Coppola, um, full um, like details of those events are to come. They haven't been published yet, but she's our featured filmmaker for March. And then we'll have April and May announced before you know it. Um, anyway, so as for our speaker tonight, uh, Joshua Ray, he is a film critic for The Lens. If you're not familiar with The Lens, that's the film criticism arm of Cinema St. Louis. Uh, Cinema St. Louis is the not-for-profit group that, among other things, puts on the St. Louis International Film Festival in November. Uh, the Webster Film Series and Cinema St. Louis are not directly affiliated. Um, a lot of people in the past have mistaken that one is operated by the other and that's not the case but we like each other a lot and work together a lot and meanwhile their film criticism the lens um does some of the best film criticism in town in terms of st louis outlets it's one of just a few that i keep up with um so if you're not familiar with them it's uh, cinemastlouis.org um and then at the top there's the option to click on the lens and you can read uh, both joshua's writing and kate laura's writing and then there are a couple others writers that are also excellent there too um, the film that we're talking about tonight is Ali Fearage the Soul, the 1974 Fassbender film. Um, I'm reluctant to say too much about it now because that's Josh's job and I don't want to step on his toes. Um, but it's an old favorite of mine. Um, we were talking, as some of you were logging on, you might have heard us talking about it before like the event officially started. 
Um, but I go back and forth on whether Fassbender's best film is Spirit to the Soul or In a Year with 13 Moons, which is the one that I'm presenting. Um, between the two, I've watched Spirit to the Soul a lot more times. Um, I've taught film appreciation on a bunch of different campuses in St. Louis, mostly at Webster and at St. Louis Community College, both Flow Valley and Merrimack. Um, but pretty much every single time I've ever taught film appreciation to any group of students ever, I've always had Spirit to the Soul on the syllabus. So I've watched it a whole lot of times with a lot of different audiences and just love it. Um, there's always more things to find about it. And it's also a fun film to watch with an audience, which I'm sad that we don't get to have that experience together. Um, but yeah, I've got probably plenty more rambling to do on the topic of Spirit to the Soul. But before I do that, I'll hand the microphone, such as it is, off to Joshua, and then I'll pipe back up. Oh, um, I guess one last thing. Um, Josh is going to do a presentation of something like half an hour, give or take. But then when he's done, we're going to do a question and answer period. So if you have observations of your own, questions for Josh, anything like that, uh, we would love to field them. Um, you can type those in at any time. I'll warn you that I'm mostly going to ignore the chat. Um, I would encourage you to put them in the Q&A box specifically. That's where I'm going to get most of them from. Um, also, if you don't want to, um, if you don't want to type in your question, there's an option that you can quote unquote raise your hand. And at that point, our operator, uh, Jessica Pierce, a film series employee, will turn on your microphone and will hear your voice and you can speak your question instead of you typing in your question. Um, but yeah, you can type in those questions at any time. And if it's something that Josh addresses in his presentation, I'll just ignore that question when the time comes. But anyway, all that said, thanks again for coming and I'll hand it over to Josh. Well, thank you so much, Pete, for inviting me to do this. Um, like you said, I've seen Fear It's the Soul quite a bit and I've seen it since I was young and this film means a lot to me and kind of informs my worldview or at least my view of what cinema can be, um, what its functions should be. Um, but it's also a very pleasurable film, um, visually speaking and intellectually speaking, uh, like most of Reiner Werner Fassbender's films. Um, before we were talking, it's funny that we, we were both kind of flip-flopping between In a Year of 13 or In a Year with 13 Moons and Fear It's the Soul as either a favorite or the best Fassbender um, because they are sort of polar opposites. If, uh, you know, uh, eight days or eight hours don't make a, a day excluded, this is probably the most pleasant uh, Fassbender's ever been or Fassbender film has ever been. Whereas In a Year with 13 Moons is, is a very difficult but a very powerful and, and wonderful film. Um, I guess the, the important part uh, to start my presentation is that Fassbender was an autobiographical filmmaker um, in some sense of the word. There's anecdotes, uh, people who have worked with him who say that every character is him or that every character is someone that he knew. Um, so when we start talking about Fear It's the Soul, the first thing I really wanna talk about is the cast, the players of the film. Um, the first of which I'd like to talk about is uh, the man himself, uh, Reiner Werner Fassbender. Um, he was born at the end of World War II, uh, raised during um, in West Germany during the Reconstruction period, and into uh, the great economic miracle, as they call it. Um, but he had a very difficult childhood. His parents divorced at age six. He lives with his father and they have a, a tumultuous relationship um, by many accounts, very violent. Um, he also came out at a very early age as a gay man. Um, but through that, uh, he goes and he lives with his mother and Fassbender has since has said that he didn't really get to know his parents until he was an adult later in life. And we'll touch on that a little bit more here in a second. Um, but as he's, you know, going into adulthood, he's interested in film and filmmaking and wants to be a director, but he's actually rejected from Berlin Film Academy. But, you know, Fassbender being the person he is, that doesn't stop him. He makes a couple shorts, one of which you can see here um, at The Little Chaos in 1966. Uh, but he gets involved in theater and political theater, theater influenced by Brecht um, with the action theater, as they were called. 
Um, but that actually gets shut down. And very shortly after that, he starts, he spearheads the anti-theater, so anti-theater. And that's where his productivity starts. Um, in the first 18 months, they have 12 productions uh, that they stage. Um, 1969, he releases his first film, uh, his debut feature, uh, feature length film, I should say. Love is Colder Than Death. And then he doesn't stop. He makes over 40 films, either theatrically released or films on television to, um, well, a handful of really big television productions like uh, Berlin Alexander Plots and World on a Wire and um, Eight Hours Don't Make a Day. Uh, but uh, that all stopped short when he dies in 1982 of a cocaine overdose. We'll learn a lot about Fassbender and his really reckless and wild ways. Um, but by all accounts, you know, he was a loving person, but a very terrible person um, to be with. And I, I think one of the people we could talk about is uh, Erm Erman, one of his earliest members of the stable of actors that he works with frequently. They actually meet when Fassbender is a teenager before he's a director and before he's involved in theater and she starts in the theater productions with them. Um, but very quickly, they have a tumultuous relationship themselves. Um, they become lovers, they become live-in lovers. And there are some accounts of Fassbender pimping out Erm um, in order for funding for some of the plays that they're doing together. And it really all stops uh, that kind of relationship whenever uh, Fassbender marries another actress, Ingrid Coven. Um, but she still comes back and is a part of the stable and works with Fassbender until the end. Um, and she actually just recently passed last year. Um, by all accounts, a wonderful woman who went through quite a bit with Fassbender. And Fassbender had a huge stable of women that he worked with, especially as he pivoted from his earlier work um, you know, the first few films he regarded as kind of Godardian uh, uh, gangster pictures and started pivoting whenever he found Douglas Sirk into movies about women. One that pops up frequently is Barbara Ballantin. Um, she's actually a really interesting figure in the Fassbender stable because she's, she's not uh, necessarily... A, uh, well known for her acting ability, she starts and she's a she's a model. Um, certainly, she has the skill, and Fassbender brings that skill out of her. Um, in her first production with him is World on a Wire, and then she's of course uh, in Furious the Soul, and continues working with him until his death. Um, but she had started in as a model in B grade movies, but Fassbender looked at her and she is kind of the ultimate Fassbender female when you just look at her. She's got that the striking eyes, the striking stare and always uh, made up and a very gorgeous woman. Uh, but it, after Fassbender dies, she's actually kind of becomes a German queer icon in her own right. Uh, she's known for having a relationship, a friendship with Freddie Mercury of Queen. And after he dies of AIDS, um, she becomes an AIDS activist. Another member of the Fassbender family literally is Lilo Pimpite. Um, this is Fassbender's mother. Um, and those of you who, uh, hopefully all of you, uh, got to see Fear It's a Soul before might be wondering why, why I'm pointing her out. She plays one of the nosy neighbors here, um, but she works with her son quite frequently. Um, they became close, but also had a, a tension-filled relationship, as most people did with Fassbender. She often plays either a, a follower, a mother figure. Um, here you can see in the third generation, she's playing a wild grandmother figure. Um, and you know, not to play, you know, pop armchair psychologist, which a lot of this will do is looking at his work through his life. Um, but she was, by all accounts, uh, had Fassbender, Right after the war, she was a member of the Nazi party, like most Germans were, 
who were living there at the time. And Fassbender really did not reconcile that uh, well. And a lot of his work does contend with the under the surface the while he was working and when he was living in West Germany. So much of it was just this shell of Nazism that was left over. And you can see that she's kind of an inspiration for the mother figure in the film, um, who's played by Brigitte, uh, Brigitte Mira, who's just one of the most wonderful actresses, one of my favorite actresses. Um, I know her almost exclusively through her work with Fassbender, but she came in rather late into the fold. And um, this is her first film with him. They worked together in a theater, well, in two contingent houses of a theater. Fassbender saw her on stage and was so impressed that he said, I have a script and I want you to do this. Um, but she, before that, she was a stage actress and a singer. And Fassbender actually made a, a really cool a uh, television special that's somewhat of a salute to that talent in Like a Bird on a Wire that comes after Ali Fear It's the Soul. Um, but she had a really difficult time fitting in by this time. Uh, the stable of crew and actors were already well-established, working together for a handful of years now. She came on and Fassbender really gave it to her and didn't treat her particularly well. And one account is that she was berated on set and called the worst actress he'd ever met. Um, whether that's Kubrick style or Fincher style, like getting someone into a performance, uh, you know, either way, it's kind of terrible treatment uh, to do for anyone. However, Mira, in an interview on the Criterion, this there's a beautiful Blu-ray edition of Ali Fiertz is sold by the Criterion Collection that includes an interview um, just a few years before her death. She has nothing but great things to say about Fassbender. Um, she goes on to talk about how after they went to Cannes together, the Cannes Film Festival, where um, Ali won a Critics' Prize, that he introduced her to Dirk Bogard and said, this is the greatest German actress who's ever lived. So there seems to be some kind of flip-flop situation happening there in the way that he would treat some of these people who were very close to him and close working with him. Um, interesting of note, uh, before a few years before she died, she participates in this short that's also included on that Criterion disc called Angst est uh, Seal Alf, which is uh, Fear Devours the Soul, um, about a, a, a violent, racially um, motivated attack of an actor who's appearing in a production of Fear It's the Soul with Brigitte Mira. So uh, that's certainly of interest if you pick up that disc. Finally, when I get to El Hedi Ben Salam, he was, Fassbender's lover, they actually met in a bathhouse. He was a guest worker, just as Ali is in Fear It's the Soul. And they started a relationship uh, far, as far back as 1971. And he first appeared on screen in The Merchant of Four Season. By all accounts and uh, by most academics, this is the mark of Fassbender's melodrama period inspired by Douglas Sirk. Um, so he works with them a few times, not often in speaking roles, but in uh, Fear It's the Soul, he does finally get the, the co-lead that I think he deserves. He's not a professional actor, but he's giving a wonderful performance. Um, Brigitte Tamira says that he was more of a mimic than anything, but that certainly works well within Fassbender's style. There's a quite tragic end for Salem. Um, he appears in Fox and His Friends because uh, shortly after Fears the Soul comes out, he goes to a bar, gets into a bar fight, stabs a few guys, and then flees back to Morocco. And while Fassbender is making Fox and His Friends the next year, um, he decides he wants to visit him. So he writes a scene with him in Morocco um, co-starring Fassbender himself. Um, 
Shortly after that, he's apprehended, put into a French jail. And in 1977, he actually hangs himself. Um, it's the first of a few lovers that Fassbender had who meet a tragic end by their own hands. Um, certainly, it'll come up with in a year with 13 moons, too. So those are the players. Now I kind of want to go through the play and first talk about its origins. Um, the story is ostensibly true. It is a story that is lifted from a Fassbender film called The American Soldier. But Fassbender wanted to make this story into a film since he heard about a um, immigrant worker who marries a cleaning lady, a German clean, cleaning lady in the 50s and ends up murdering her. Um, but that is not quite the story that he tells here. And one of the reasons that it morphs into something else is Fassbender, uh, as I mentioned, in 1971, he sees six films by Douglas Sirk um, and is completely inspired by him. Sirk is also a German man who um, immigrated to the United States, to Hollywood, uh, right before uh, World War II. And he also works in the theater, was also inspired by Brecht. But as he began working uh, during and after the war, he became known for working at um, American International or uh, Universal Pictures with producer Ross Hunter and making these, uh, what they would call women's pictures or melodramas but they're incredibly incisive and beautiful films. And uh, Fassbender wrote about the six films that I saw, All That Heaven Allows, the inspiration for the kind of morphing of Fear Eats the Soul into what we know it now. And he said this, in the beginning, Rock, that's Rock Hudson, loves nature and Jane, Jane Wyman, the female lead, at first doesn't love anything because she has everything. It's a pretty shitty starting point for great love, her, him, and the world around them. But basically, that's how it looks. She has a motherly touch. She gives the impress impression she could completely melt at the right moment. You can understand why Rock is wild about her. He's the tree trunk. He's perfectly right when he wants to be with this woman. The world around them is the evil. The women all have large mouths. There aren't any other men in the film besides Rock. The easy chairs are more important and the drinking glasses. To judge by this film, an American small town is the last place I'd want to go. Finally, Jane tells Rock when she's leaving him because of the idiot children and so on. Rock doesn't put up much of a fight. He has nature after all. And Jane sits there on Christmas Eve. The children are going to leave her and have given her a television set. At that point, everyone in the movie house breaks down. They suddenly understand something about the world and what it does to people. Then later, Jane goes back to Rock because she keeps having headaches, which happens to all of us if we don't fuck enough. But when she's back, it isn't a happy ending, even though they're together, the two of them. A person who creates so many problems in love won't be able to be happy later on. That's what the films are about from Douglas Sirk. Human beings can't be alone, but they can't be together either. So the idea of melodrama becomes very important to Fassbender as he shifts from those earlier avant-garde films. He sees melodrama as a form that he can use to talk about societal issues in Germany and universal issues too. So I'm going to go through a scene in Ali, Fear Eats the Soul, that I think is uh, emblematic of Fassbender's work as a whole, but also the film as a whole. It's a, a mirror of a scene in All That Heaven Allows when the woman announces to her children that she's married a man. Um, the man in this one, of course, is not just a younger man, but he's also an immigrant worker. And the age gap compared to the age gap between Rock Hudson and Jane Wyman in All That Heaven Allows considerably bigger. So first, let's talk about the melodrama form. It is more of a style than necessarily a genre. The form can kind of, the best of them can be applied to many different genres. And there have been arguments that 
Um, Hitchcock himself is a melodramatist and therefore by extension, someone like Brian De Palma is a melodramatist. Um, but the melodrama itself is really best when it's a mass of contradictions. It's a form that is an entertaining form, it tells a story that's easily digestible, but it's also a political form. Uh, this is something that's rather Brechtian in its inception because uh, Brecht would always have his theater as um, really calling attention to the form of itself so that there was distance between the viewer and the finished product. And within that distance, it required more out of an audience member so that they could understand the political ramifications of what was happening within uh, his production. Uh, so melodrama, the best uh, are also kind of unrealistic. If you look at the films of Cirque, they're filled with the craziest of colors, the craziest of set design, costume design. They are really, truly Hollywood products. Fassbender, Tam sat down, um, I would say considerably, but it, as you guys know, having watched this film, there is a, a stiltedness, but also a beating heart underneath that. And that's the contradiction there. There are beautiful surfaces, um, but the beauty is also oppressive. And what rises through those beautiful surfaces is the ugliness of people. They're love stories about the impossibility of love and how personal identity, the inside, as you would think, is actually shaped by outside forces. And there's a reason why a lot of queer filmmakers, queer artists um, employ melodramatic form is all of these reasons I listed can be seen as having uh, queer qualities, at least as far as in queer life or queer identities. And on identity, um, looking at this, the next shot in this scene, you can see that Emmy is now standing in opposition from her family and uh, some tokens of her past. These are her husband's medals from fighting in the war that she talks about is in there, but her uh, new husband is actually off screen. Uh, and with that, Jonathan Goldberg uh, it wrote this wonderful book um, that Kate Lohr uh, directed me to called Melodrama and Aesthetics of Impossibility. In a really wonderful chapter, he relates Cirque's All That Heaven Allows, Fassbender's Fear It's the Soul, and Todd Haynes' Far From Heaven, um, one after the other being extension of the last. But he says this of identification uh, in melodrama. Identification is located at the complicated nexus where submitting to the inexorable is coupled with resistance Identification involved a process of coming to identify by experiencing ourselves, the location outside of us. This process of feeling with, of identifying as, thus involves being ourselves by not being ourselves. So this is another aspect of melodrama is the tension within ourselves and the outside is what creates us. So of that tension, you can see in this next shot that uh, it is a almost a mirror image of the first shot that I presented, except Emmy is now crapped out of it and her children and uh, children-in-law are now on their own, their own group without Emmy in there. Um, so really I wanna talk about alienation as a Fassbender theme um, in both theme and style. Uh, so as you can see here, she's literally alienated out of the frame, but also what's happening is that her, her family is saying, no more, we can't be a part of what you've done here. Um, so Fassbender does alienation many different ways and inspired uh, certainly by Bertolt Brecht and the Brechtian method that I just mentioned earlier. Um, the first scene is a bar entrance with a group stand in stark opposition to each other and they're frozen in these unnatural tableaus. It's alienating us, but through this alienation, we can see this, the symbolism of these two opposing groups and how you are distilling theme from the opposition. And he holds so long in there uh, as to alienate 
the viewer in a Brechtian method. Um, so it, of one production, Brecht said, uh, in the same way as it refuses to tacitly have over its heroes the world as through an inalterable, uh, inalterable destiny, it also has no intention of handing over the spectator to a suggestive theater experience. So the alienation creates identification and does not um, work as a didactic form. Instead, the action, he says, takes place outside of the theater, having seen the production that people understand how the world works and would take action within that. Another way Fassbender uh, shows, visualizes, thematizes alienation is in spaces. Um, before, in his earlier work, uh, he's often presenting the film as through an arch presidium in that he will just have a front facing camera capturing movement. There's still gorgeous films. Um, most of what I'm talking about is in black and white, um, certainly influenced by the, the work of Jean-Luc Godard and um, Straub Humet. And um, what you'll see is as he goes into melodrama and goes into Cirque, He's exploring 3D spaces uh, like he hadn't before. So in, uh, to that note, in All That Heaven Allows, he wrote something about these spaces and how they're created and what they mean within All That Heaven Allows. And I think that you can see here that it also applies to Fear Eats the Soul. The people in Cirque's films are all, um, static in settings that are shaped to an extreme degree by their social situation. The sets are extraordinarily accurate. In Jane's house, you can only move a certain way. Only sentences occur to you when you want to say something and certain gestures when you want to express something. If Jane entered another house, rocks for instance, would she be able to adjust? That would be something to hope for. Or has she molded and messed up that in rocks house? She would miss the style that's all hers. That's more likely. That's why the happy ending is not a real one. Jane fits into her own house better than rocks. So he is using these spaces as places where the characters are alienated because they just simply do not belong. They have not created those spaces themselves. And this is where the queer identity comes in too for Fassbender um, in that, other people know what it's like to be in spaces that are not particularly theirs. You think about the bar when Emmy first enters and how the group is standing in stark opposition staring at her um, versus how the uh, his Moroccan friends are whenever they're in Emmy's house and her own space and how she interacts with them certainly the public spaces when these two are together and how they are in opposition of literally almost everyone around them. Finally, how Emmy feels whenever she goes into Ollie's work near the end. So on this uh, alienation, one thing that Fassbender rarely does is move his camera. Um, it kind of comes from Cirque, but it, it comes from earlier out of necessity because camera movement and filmmaking is much more expensive than static setups. Um, Cirque always said that he was writing with the cameras, that the, the camera was his philosophy. And for Fassbender, you remember this particular scene where he goes across the family members and shows the gallery of looks that they're all giving in, uh, after Ali has been revealed uh, to them that it's kind of punctuation or also emphasis in Fassbender when something is as ostentatious as a camera movement happens. But also within this scene, we're uh, looking at what Todd Haynes, uh, who does an excellent piece on Fear It's a Soul on the Criterion Disc calls a system of looks. He says that looks freeze these participants in their stations the same way that spaces divide them, the same way that the groups split themselves and the camera splits them. It reinforces the groups, but it also helps the audience to implicitly understand the theme of the film through looks. 
And here we come to repetition, mirrors. Uh, these are just old standards of melodrama and the best melodrama, especially the directors that I've mentioned right now. As you can see, um, having talked about All That Heaven Allows and that famous TV scene, Fassbender makes a mirror of a scene in All That Heaven Allows, but also smashes through that mirror almost literally whenever uh, Emmy's son breaks the television set. But I want to talk about literal mirrors that appear. Um, you can think of when Ali looks at himself in a mirror and whenever Emmy looks at themselves in a mirror. What's interesting is something Cirque said is I always use mirrors because it actually shows the opposite. You think it's showing the truth, but what it's doing you is, is flipping your image and showing you the complete opposite of you. So there's a tension in there with identity uh, that uh, people think that they're seeing themselves, but it is not in fact. But uh, Fassbender also mirrors other things too, often in uh, within the same film, he's going through and showing how uh, systemic oppression works. And think about the scene with Emmy, uh, where her, after learning about her marriage with Ali, her coworkers ostracize her out of the group and she's shown alone on the stairs. And then later that scene plays again, once they know that uh, they have another person to ostracized through the group in the immigrant worker who's come to work with them. The scene repeats itself almost literally with the same movement, the same setups, um, just to show that kind of systemic and cyclical uh, oppression that happens. Uh, of repetition, uh, James Roy McBean, who wrote an excellent essay called um, Cinema of Self-Portrait about Fassbender's films, repetition, variation, reversal. That is the pattern of Fassbender's closed melodramas. But the reversal is not a reversal of fortune. No, on the contrary, it's a redoubling of misfortunes, a compounding of the woes of life, which by the end of the film have come to press in new and unexpected quarters, as well as from their old sources. And of those old sources, we can talk about history. In Fassbender's work, um, the past is always present. It certainly has to have something to do with him being raised during the reconstruction of West Germany and his reconciliation with his mother being a member of the party. Emmy tosses off the word Hitler like it's nothing. They go to the restaurant where Hitler used to eat. She asks if Ali understands who Hitler was. Um, he did say that uh, of his work and of where he lived, he said that if you scratch the surface of West, West Germany underneath, you're always gonna find a swastika. And, you know, dealing with that, reconciling with all of that, uh, society is certainly a major theme with in Fassbender. Here in this particular film, we're talking about uh, race. You know, at one point, Ali talks about how he's treated at work. He says uh, German master, Arab dog, when he's talking about his treatment at work, the way that the uh, neighbors talk about Ali is certainly striking and shocking. Um, there are ideas of gender. If you look at how the marriage between the characters of Fassbender and Araman, and then how that compares to the marriage between Emmy and Ali, but ultimately Fassbender was interested in class as uh, the biggest division and one that with the prescience he, he saw that was going to be even greater. And so we are living through that now. But he also understood this cyclical nature that as um, the statuses change, as people move through stratification, an outsider is always replaced. So prisons is a, a real hard word for what Fassbender does, but it's, it's certainly true in how he visualizes these ideas of people who make their own prisons, who live within society's uh, frames, that have put them there. You often see characters framed between walls, framed in doorways like Erm Herman here. Um, but you also think about the sea of yellow chairs that 
uh, Ali and Emmy are swimming in and how it kind of creates a cage for the restaurant participants who are standing far away, who Emmy finally decides to berate and say, I, I can't believe you're doing this. We're just human. It's my husband. It's my man. We're in love. Um, it's a, a beautiful image, but it's a heartbreaking image too that kind of thematizes the idea of these prisons that people live within. Finally, one of my favorite shots of the film, I think a, a shot that might work as a thesis for it, um, talk about love and relationships. I think with these two characters, the attraction is palpable. I think a lot of folks would also be confused about what is attractive to this younger man for this older woman, this older woman for this younger man. That's certainly a problem that occurs in their relationship. There's this scene where Emmy comes into the bathroom and um, Ali is stark naked and she stops and she says, Ali, you're just so beautiful. And he smiles and, uh, but also, Later on, that becomes kind of a sticking point for him in that he becomes this kind of presentation that uh, Emmy gives to her friends. But I think one of the things that attracts them is the loneliness that they both have. They're both othered in some ways, in very different ways, but it attracts them to each other. And there's idea of loneliness. Uh, I love when Emmy has him stay over and she says, I have a toothbrush for you. I once bought a pack of 10. Um, of course, love in relationships needs change as the circumstances change. Um, you see that after they go on their vacation, Ali is sort of used by Emmy, but then Ali also rejects that usage and you know um, goes against his marriage and has an affair with Barbara Valentin's uh, 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 bartender bar owner. But uh, I think ultimately saying uh, love is work. And if you think about the, the theme of the film, something that Fassbender prefaces the film with and it says during the film is that uh, happiness is not always fun. So on that, on that <laughs> exciting and dour note, um, I think we can go to some discussion. If Pete wants to come in and uh, ask me a few questions. I see some have come in too. Yeah, I do want to come in and ask some questions. Um, I would like to encourage our um, viewers to please do pipe up with your questions. We've got a couple of good ones already. Um, so I wanted to start with this film. Um, we decided collectively, at the Fassbender speakers, that it's the best place to start. But then I also wanted to start with Josh because he is likable. Um, we, um, I, I'm not show faculty in the way that one might hope for someone who is the host of events like these. Um, so I wanted the first speaker to be someone that people would actually like, um, so that maybe you'll come back to our future events. Uh, so thank you, Josh, for doing what I would hope, what I hoped you would do. Um, but on that note, wh what is it about this one? What is it about Periods to Soul? Like, why is this the best entry point? It's not his first film by any stretch. Like, what is relatable about it? who is it that we're relating to? Like, why, what makes this one stand out? I think it's a distillation of everything he would work on throughout the 13 years he was active making films. I think the reason I wanted to go through and talk about through that one scene, common themes throughout his work is that here there's this sort of lightness to it there's a simplicity to it. The film unfolds sort of like a fable. And I think there's a, a few ways he achieves that. Um, one, there's a simplicity in the language. There's a simplicity in performance. Its construction is a, a kind of, has mirrors, uh, it mirrors each other, that midpoint with the, uh, the uh, sea of tables and everything. And certainly the music <laughs> is, is very fable-like, you know, that kind of very soft music that he has playing throughout it. But for me, I discovered this film when I was a teenager, having recently come out as gay. 
Now, these people are not gay <laughs> in, in this film. However, there's an identification with them um, as a kind of queer relationship and the things that queer people go through throughout their lives, even as, you know, it gets better or whatever. <laughs> but I, I think there's a simplicity to it compared to a lot of his work that really struck at the right time. Um, I, I could rattle off a few other films that also work this way, but historically, this is the one that I think hit and hit worldwide. And so it becomes a sort of the entry point for Fassbender by default that way. But I think it deserves it. And I think it's deserving because of the simplicity. One of our questions from the audience is on this topic. So I'll go to that one next. Uh, this is from an apparently shy anonymous attendee. I wonder who it is. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> the question is, the film's th themes of race, love, and isolation resonate with me in a new way given the events of the last year. Have these events changed your own perception of the film? No. Um, no, they haven't, um, because I think they're always universal. I understand where the, the, the question is coming from and that feeling of loneliness is probably more palpable now in Fear Eats the Soul from when I've seen it before, but that was always present. Uh, you know, it's interesting, everything we're watching right now, at least everything I'm watching right now, I'm seeing through the lens of the pandemic, of the isolation, of lockdown, of not being with my, you know, my close group of friends, not seeing my extended family. But to go back to why this is, quote unquote, the one, um, it's, these people are easily identifiable with. We understand uh, with a striking clarity what their struggles are. Um, so it, it hasn't really changed for me. What has changed for me over time since I, you know, was a teenager and saw it, oh, I don't know, 20 years ago, uh, is having gone through relationships and seeing how relationships function and how the kind of love survives throughout that. That's what has come up to the surface in this for me, um, other than kind of identifying with the, the othered uh, characters in this film. Well, on that note, I've always wondered, it's a question I always used to like to ask my classes, do you think Emmy and Ali need for people to not approve of them to work? Because um, as soon as people start to maybe questionably approve of them, that's when their marriage starts to fall apart. So do they feed off of the disapproval? So this is when the need changes in relationships, right? It, it, it is in the text of the film, the question that you're asking, is that what is keeping them together as two very different people is that they identify with the alienation that they experience. And after that changes, you still see that there's still love there. You still see that there's a value in that relationship. Um, there's one symbolic nod that would make me say, absolutely, you're right. This thesis that you have is correct. And that after the scene with the, the yellow sea, or the yellow sea of, uh, yeah, I did this on purpose because I'm a nerd, of chairs and tables that create that kind of cage for them, um, the very next scene, Emmy is wearing that color. So it's kind of, it's, she sublimated it um, and made it into an identity. And I think that's with, Fassbender does that with purpose because it is a striking color. It's also the color of her shoes the entire time. I stared at it this time. Well, that brings up an interesting point. Um, the, it's, I feel like this is more, um, like the colors in Fear to the Soul are more saturated than they are um, in most of Fassbender's other films. And it's more, he's more deliberate with color. But I wanted to come back to costumes. Um, I've seen it implied that the costuming in this film is something close to arbitrary, um, that Fassbender was like the opposite of a perfectionist and that, you know, um, 
um, like the the barmaid at the asphalt bar just like wore her own clothes. Um, and you know, like certain scenes in different parts of the film were shot on the same day. So like they were wearing the same costumes in these di different scenes just because it, like by virtue of the fact they're shot on the same day. But it's always struck me as particularly deliberate. Um, and it's probably best exemplified in Ali. And then at the beginning of the film, he's wearing very dark suits and Emmy specifically tells him that he shouldn't wear such dark suits because they look sad. And then he wears lighter suits. But then by the end of the film, he's just wearing t-shirts and jeans most of the time. Um, where Emmy, um, I don't know, I feel like there's kind of that breakthrough moment, like where he first maybe really fall in love with the film, where Emmy agrees to dance and she takes her coat off and it's like she's dressed to party. Um, I was unclear for a long time if that was maybe like a uniform for her job or something, but the other people, the other, um, like her colleagues that she cleans with, they don't wear anything like that. Like she is wearing kind of a particularly loud outfit. Did you ever have a take on that? Like, um, I feel like I'm at odds with anything I've ever read about the film that said the costuming was arbitrary. Like it always did feel very specific to me. Yeah, Laura, uh, Laura Cottingham in her uh, uh, BFI Classics book about Fear It's a Soul talks about this and also says some really wild things about Fossbender using his women characters as drag queens and I, I don't know. But she talks about that too. She talks about the kind of arbitrary nature of how it was, this film was made in, and I've heard anywhere from 13 to 16 days and a final release print was ready within four weeks, meaning from day one of shooting to four weeks later, it was good to go. Um, of course, when you make 40 films, I guess that's how you work. Um, but one thing I always notice is, you know, you bring up the, the costuming, in particular Ali, and how he's catering to Emmy and Emmy's lifestyle, but when he rejects it, that's when he goes back to, to mechanic and t-shirt and jeans, right? But uh, Emmy is also doing something very similar. In the first few scenes, the first night that they spend together, and when she enters the bar, Emmy has gray hair. But throughout the rest of the film, her hair is bright red. Um, it's never really made a point, but I notice it. And I notice that she's dressing up for uh, Ollie. So I don't think there are arbitrary choices in here. If they are arbitrary, um, th there's psychic ability happening there that, that makes them really work thematically uh, within this film and throughout Fassbender. I mean, he, he his films are, you know, as the kids say, iconic because of their sort of the fashion that he uses, the the actors and actresses and the way that they dress, the way that they make are they made up and how indicative they are of that era. But they're always, uh, even when they're, you know, down in the depths, like uh, in a year with 13 moons, there's this morning outfit that El Elvira wears that is impeccable and great. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's deliberate, and if not, I don't care. <laughs> I think that's a good attitude. Yeah. Um, I've got a bunch more questions. I've, yeah, I've got so many questions I want to ask, but I've got a couple of good ones from Stephen Tronicek and then another one from my colleague Jessica. So I want to uh, give them the floor before I just hog all the time. I know I don't want to take too long in this meeting. I know everyone is, I don't know, I was thinking when I was putting these meetings together, what did people want more of right now? They want more Zoom meetings, right? And they want really long Zoom meetings that never end. Um, so that's why I prepared so many questions. Um, but yeah, anyway, hopefully we'll get back to mine. But for now, um, Stephen Tronicek asks, the scenes are composed of these wonderful static shots and interspersed with a few dolly moves. What do you think are the defining factors of the visual language in Fassbender melodramas? Um, no dissolve. It's always violent cuts. Um, and you see that often in Cirque too. Uh, some of my favorite shots, well, you see dissolves in, in Cirque, but some of my favorite shots in Cirque are quick pans and cuts. And it's often with a kind of emotional violence that, between characters. So you see this cutting pattern in uh, Fassbender's work often. Uh, but like I said before, um, it is often just static setups and extended shots too, to really live in it. That's where the Brechtian notion of the, the distance between the shot and calling attention to the form and the viewer 
uh, and living in that experience. Uh, but when he does move the camera, as he does in this scene I wanted to point out where he does this gallery of looks, it is for emphasis. Um, but I, even going into, I'm going too long on this, but uh, even going into to later films, um, something like Berlin Alexander Plots, it is shot the same way. He has the same vernacular, cinematic vernacular there. Um, pretty much past everything, past uh, uh, March of Four Seasons. And not to say that he didn't continually evolve because he, he certainly did in um, theme and style. But as far as the, the cinematic language, there was a consistency there that's very strong. Well, I've always thought, I've never seen any evidence it was intentional on his part. Um, but from the very first time I saw it, I thought that the shot, a shot of Emmy and Ali that's framed by the doorway when they're in Hitler's favorite restaurant and it hangs on them for like 10 seconds. It seems like there's something wrong with the DVD or something. Yes. Um, but it, it mirrors the shot, the final shot of The Graduate, I feel like, where there's kind of just a staring, like, what have we gotten ourselves into type of thing. That was the thought I had this time watching it, is that that's e exactly what Mike Nichols is doing in The Graduate. But somehow the the distance and just everything that surrounds it, you feel it, or I feel it so much more deeply than the ending. Um, and maybe because the ending of The Graduate is um, so kind of like iconic and shocking and, and that they're young kids and that we're dealing with uh, much more dire circumstances here. Um, but that's the exact same thought I had watching it this time. Okay, so here's another question from Stephen Tronichek. Um, the use of color is so striking in Fassbender's films, which is definitely a feature of the Cirque films as well, and the space it seems so lived in. Do you know anything about the control of different production design items in relation to the real locations that Fassbender would shoot in? It looks designed, but still a bit worn. Uh, yeah, uh, there was purpose. A lot of it was not Fassbender himself, um, according to some accounts. Um, Pete, you might remember the gentleman's name uh, better than I do immediately, but he did have a set decorator that he worked with quite often, but who would go uh, uncredited or Fassbender would credit himself as having done it. So um, either way, by and I say by many accounts because there are so many stories about Fassbender. He worked with so many people. He was such a strong figure that there's volumes and volumes of stories about him. Um, but he would have actors doing five different jobs at the same time that they were um, you know, performing in his film. So I think that points to one, there is purpose, but also to his kind of working mode and that he could work very quickly. Uh, like I said, this is like a two week movie and it's one of the greatest movies ever made. Um, the question from Jessica is, if, uh, she was hoping that you could speak to the disconnect between Ollie and Emmy's experiences. Um, they're both considered outsiders in different environments, but Emmy does downplay Ollie's experience at times, which puts a strain between them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, especially after that vacation that they have, and even before it, when he tries to give her money and she says, I, I don't want your money here, I'll keep it for you even though you end up finding out that they make about the same amount of money um, as she's balancing the checkbooks. So there's, there's certainly something that she doesn't understand that he's doing that because there's an amount of, of pride and that he doesn't wanna be taken care of um, because he is this kind of ostracized person uh, who faces this great racism uh, in his life and as a guest worker in, uh, Germany. And she certainly does shrug that off uh, many times. And at, after they come back from their vacation, she kind of uses him as an object. She has him go help the downstairs neighbors um, who have finally found a reason to, uh, uh, to let them coexist, right? in getting help from Ali. And then, um, you know, this infamous scene or famous scene where they feel his muscles and the second, the second they do that, he looks like he's into it, right? The second he does it, I'm out. You know, it, 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 Emmy is not a terrible person, but Emmy is also an older person who's been conditioned by uh, German culture and German history. And 
she certainly has a, a, a scars of World War II um, and Hitler and being a member of the party that are present and that she even just talks about it very cavalierly. Um, I think that's one great thing about this film is that they're both equally, um, they're not saints by any measure. Well, Emmy revels in kind of surprising people with Ali too, which I always think is kind of funny and mm. kind of horrible. But like the way mm. she introduces him to her family, you know, like she doesn't break the news gently. She's got him hiding behind a door and he pops out. And then she gives his full name, El Hedi Ben Salam Bark Muhammad Mustafa, which actually is that actor's name, incidentally, yes. if this, that's his full name. Um, but yeah, like it, it's like she's trying to provoke a reaction. Like she's not trying to break, break the news in any like gentle way. It um, is. It's kind of like, you know, she's she's gotten older, she's lonely, she, and there's some amount of the tension that she gets from that kind of relationship, as much as it pains her to be in it, she does revel in it. Yeah. I just want to, um, we're going to start losing people here quickly if we haven't already, but I've got one more question that's related to uh, what we were talking about. Um, so Emmy and Ollie are generally regarded as among the nicest people in any Fassbender film. Like, they're kind of generally nice people where Fassbender characters tend not to be nice at all. Genuinely nice is not something you hear about people that he writes. Uh, but here, Emmy is so, you've mentioned several times, she's quick to mention Hitler and like how she used to be a Nazi and she's sort of blase about it. And on some level, she seems to maybe still look up to Hitler. The fact that like she takes her wedding day as opportunity to go to Hitler's favorite restaurant. What are we to make of that? Like what does Fassbender, what does Fassbender expect us to do with that information, do you think? As a viewer without context, um, I think it is is pointing to his view of um, contemporary West Germany. Like he said that uh, if you scratch the surface, there's always a swastika underneath. Um, and that a lot of people who were uh, leaders in the Nazi party after World War II continued being leaders even in West Germany. Um, and Fassbender later, he, <laughs> is so radically left wing that he gets involved in the RAF, you know, Bader Meinhof. Um, so I think it's, it is a kind of a hint to his idea of what contemporary West Germany is like um, and the people who are its citizens and who have been there forever. But that's the culture that bears the fruit of the kind of racism that Ali faces as a guest worker, or that Emmy faces as you know an older woman who's married um, an immigrant. Uh, so it all kind of doubles back on itself logically in a way that I feel makes sense for that character and makes sense uh, for Fassbender's idea of West Germany. Well, I guess that's a good a good note to end on Hitler, right? That's that's uh, sure. the, the, the best place to stop. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to invite everybody that's on now, uh, please do come back. I mean, come back to the rest of them. Just mark Thursday nights off your calendar for a while and come to all of these. I'd love it. Uh, but next week specifically, Kate Lohr is going to talk about Bitter Tears of Petra von Kant. Um, Petra is one of Fassbender's most beloved films, one of his most influential, one of his most studied. I mean, Kate is terrific with Fassbender. She's really, really good on the topic. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to next week's event. Uh, but thank you, Josh, for doing our, our opening night gig. And uh, thanks again for everyone to everyone for coming. And hopefully I'll see you next week. Thanks again, Pete.